Good day to everybody and a warm welcome to the second payoff, the, the, the second of the payoff webinars that um, are jointly being organized and hosted by the Embassy of Japan and Stellenbosch University this month. Today's webinar, in addition to being hosted by the Embassy of Japan and Stellenbosch University, is also supported by the Institute of Enology and Viticulture at the University of Yamanashi in Japan. Uh, by One's Magazine, which is a trade magazine based in Japan, and also by Wines of South Africa, Japan. So uh, we'd also like to acknowledge um, all of our partners um, who have been collaborating with us in putting together today's webinar. I am Scarlett Cornelison. I'm a professor at the Department of Political Science at Stellenbosch University, and I will be moderating the discussion today. Yesterday, some of you may have joined the, the webinar on sake yesterday. It was a highly successful webinar, and we had a good discussion about uh, Japanese sake and the potentials, especially for um, more or greater import um, of um, and, and sake trade uh, with uh, South Africa. We are following up yesterday's discussion with a discussion today on the appeal of South African wine and the Japanese wine market. As I noted in my opening remarks yesterday, the two webinars on Japanese sake and on South African wine today are tandem and they speak directly to each other because our aim with the two webinars is to try to put specialist and general audiences in Japan and South Africa in conversation with each other. Uh, South Africa and Japan um, uh, both uh, pride themselves on, on the respective products, uh, sake and, and wine, and uh, both Japan and South Africa hold very strong global reputations uh, for uh, their prize uh, products. We have quite a lineup of distinguished uh, speakers from academia um, and also from the South African and Japanese wine trade today, and I will briefly introduce um, each of the speakers before their presentations. Before I do so, let me first uh, outline a few house rules. First, please note that we are offering simultaneous English Japanese translation or interpretation, I, I apologize, for this webinar. At the bottom of your Zoom um, uh, page on your, on your screen, you will see a tab labeled interpretation. Uh, please click on that tab and select your, cha your channel, English or Japanese. English speaking participants can simply click on, on English. Secondly, please keep your mic on mute at, uh, at all times, unless if you are presenting. And also please keep your videos switched off throughout um, the discussion, unless uh, again, uh, you are the person who's presenting. We ask all presenters to please switch on their cameras while they do the presentation. Thirdly, we are recording the session and we will gladly make available the recording afterwards. Lydia Duplessis, will post details about where the recording can be found um, in the, the Zoom chat room. Please do post your questions using the Zoom chat function. We um, have been uh, instructed that there will not be a live Q&A session um, uh, for today's webinar. So what we are asking you to do is to um, post your, your questions um, in the uh, Zoom chat function. We will collate the questions and will um, distribute the questions uh, after the webinar. The idea is that we, uh, in this way, want to facilitate exchange between presenters and um, participants after today's discussion. So especially if you'd like to, to, to um, uh, put more technical or complex questions, um, these kinds of questions are, are uh, better dealt with offline. And last, lastly, we ask all participants to complete uh, a short feedback form Lydia, again, will email um, the feedback form uh, to all registered participants after um, the end of the webinar. So with the house, house rules um, uh, uh, covered, let me introduce the order of discussion and uh, the lineup of the presenters. We start off with a presentation by Dr. Marion Mackay. Um, Dr. Mackay is a senior lecturer in enology at Stellenbosch University. She has a BSc in chemistry and uh, geography, geography from the University of Cape Town. And she also holds a, a master's, an MSc in agriculture from Stellenbosch um, University and a PhD uh, in enology. And in her early career, she worked 
as an analytical chemist at the University of Cape Town. Uh, Dr. Mackay is quite an interesting person. Um, so with her science background and, and working um, uh, uh, on this, the, the, the chemistry of, of, of wine, she, she also has a keen interest in um, teaching and, and learning. So Dr. Mackay's research has taken her into um, quite um, divergent uh, territories uh, uh, from volatile phenol, phenol interactions and smoke taint in wine to engage the learning methodologies and sensory evaluation. Dr. Mackay has published in Enology and Teaching and Learning, and she is recognized for her contributions in both fields. She won the National South African Council for Higher Education Excellence in Teaching Award in 2015, and was recognized by Stellenbosch University as a distinguished teacher a couple of years ago. Dr. Mackay's talk is entitled Delightful Diversity, the Expression of Terroir in South African Wines. So I hand over now to Dr. Mackay. Thank you very much, Scarlett. Um, I apologize in advance, and I know one shouldn't start a, a, um, a presentation by apologizing, but I have, uh, I have building works going on in the background, which I had no idea were going to happen. So the generator and the noises, um, I hope won't be too distracting. Anyway, thank you very much for inviting me to be here. It's a privilege and a delight to be able to, a delightful delight to be able to talk about South African wine. And, uh, and I welcome everybody who's here and I hope that you find it interesting and thought provoking. Um, I'm going to talk about the expression of terroir in South African wine and I'm going to talk a little bit, give a very brief historical and industrial and geographical overview, and then look at wine of origin because it is so inherent to what we're going to talk about. And then to do an overview, only a brief overview of aroma impacts and the impact of terroir, and then the Western Cape unique characteristics. Again, a very brief overview. You're welcome to post your questions in the chat. So the historical context of South African wine is that it started as a result of the Cape being a shipping post, a, a post office and a provisioning post. And the Dutch started making wine almost immediately they arrived here. In fact, they arrived in 1652 and in 1659, they had already harvested their first grapes. So they clearly recognized the importance of South African terroir. During the dark years of apartheid, unfortunately, even though South African wines had gained um, importance on international uh, markets over, over historical times, for example, Napoleon loved Vin de Constance, um, we didn't export our wines, our, 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 and therefore the quality of the wines was not as good as it might have been. However, we're now the eighth largest producer of wine in the world, more than 300,000 people are actually employed in the wine industry in the Cape. And the harvest for 2020 was over a million liters. Uh, there's education and world-class research that's happening as a result of the South African wine industry. The concept of terroir is obviously fundamental to what we're going to talk about now. And there we are at the tip of Africa, um, surrounded by sea. And, uh, and in a very African context. And terroir has been around as a concept for millennia, for, for at least 2000 years. It refers to the nat natural features of a piece of land and which then give the specific characteristics of the wines that are produced there. This concept has formed the basis of many international appellation systems and the wine of origin system is the quality appellation system in South Africa. In terms of climate, this has an incredibly important um, influence on flavor. Most Western Cape wine growing areas have a Mediterranean climate with long hot summers and cool wet winters, and they are strongly influenced by the two huge oceans that meet at the tip of Africa, the Atlantic or the cold, with the cold Benguela current in the West, and the Indian with the warm uh, Indian current in the, in the east. 
These bring coastal fogs, cooling sea breezes, and specifically the notorious southeaster, which is our very, very strong wind in summer, which drives everybody crazy. All of these make for ideal viticultural conditions. Our geology is also unique. As you can see on the slide, there are a series of mountains, the Cape Fold Mountains running along the, the, the interior with a, with a coastal belt. So we have very, very varied topography, different altitudes, different aspects, the uh, direction of slope, we have different soils, some of the oldest soils in the world. We have Precambrian soils um, between 20 and 200 meters altitude and sandstone. We have decomposed granite. There's a vast range of soils, some, some of which are actually nearly a billion years old. The mountains give the varied topography and the distinctiveness and lead to huge diversity in the terroir in the Cape. Some farms have a very long history and culture dating right back to the Dutch and the um, French settlers, the Huguenots who came out in the late 1700s. But a lot of other farms are breaking new ground with new practices and dif doing different and sometimes quite maverick things with their products. And the, the soils, the idea of biodiversity and the conservation and preservation of the soil and the landscape is incredibly important in, in South African winemaking. There you can see some images from the Western Cape and you can see the Cape Fold Mountains, um, the sea that has such a huge impact and then the Southeaster dri driving. We also have Feinbos, which is our natural vegetation and Feinbos is prone to fire. I will get back to this in a second. The, the basis of the South African um, quality system is the wine of origin system. This was developed in 1973, and an official seal, which you can see on the right, is given to each bottle of wine. And this verifies the labels that are uh, made on, the, on the, the information on the label and links to environmental sustainability, which is very important. In order to understand the wine of origin system, and I know that this wasn't necessarily part of my brief, but I have to do it, um, I'm going to have a look at some production units. The South African wine growing region is, is uh, divided into demarcated areas, and, and we, we call these um, wine of origin units. The first, is there is somebody trying to speak? Is there a question? No? Okay. Um, the geographical units are the largest units and the Northern Cape and the Western Cape at the moment are the most important of the, of the wine producing areas. As we get below this, we get to the regions. These are very large units which enable farms from different districts to, with a similar climate to blend their wines together and, and have a wine of origin. Um, an example of this would be the coastal region um, or the Breda River Valley region. The next one in the wine of origin system are the districts. The, these are defined using the macro geographical characteristics such as mountains and rivers and districts include the famous Stellenbosch, Robertson and the very famous Swartland. A ward is a smaller area with natural factors like soil and climate with a clear influence on the character of the wine. So a ward may not necessarily be part of a district. Examples of wards would include Elgin, Constantia, and Sederberg. Below this, we get two smaller um, demarcated areas. One is the estate, where wine is made in a particular far, on a particular farm with its own cellar, and then a single vineyard, which may not be bigger than six hectares, but which can be farmed and bottled and produced as, as a single vineyard. And this, of course, is very important when we talk about old vines and old, and old vine wines. The next thing I'm going to do is share with you some aroma compounds that are affected by terroir. I'm going to deviate slightly from the brief from the document that I, that I sent through, because I actually found, obviously, at the last minute, as one does, I found a really, really good overview, which I will share with you 
the, the, the uh, link to that paper. So let's have a look at some compounds. The first group of compounds that are really affected by terroir and by, by um, the landscape are the methoxypyrazines. These include uh, three isobutyl, two methoxypyrazine, the compound on the far left. Um, and they are very, very important in cultivars like Sauvignon Blanc, Cabernet Sauvignon, and Semillon. The influence of these three, this range of compounds from the foxy pyrazines gives us grassiness, green pepper, famously, green beans, asparagus, herbaceousness, and tinned vegetable character when, they, when, they, when they're present in the wine at specific levels. They have very low detection thresholds, so we're very good at detecting them. The second group of compounds that are influenced by terroir, but in a slightly different and more, less direct way, are the volatile thiols. The first group is the mecaptans, and that includes 4-methylpentanone, 4-MMP, for, for those of us who are lazy, on the far, far left-hand side, and then the other, the other mecaptans, which are, which are shown there. These are very nice compounds generally, and they have flavor, tropical fruit flavors like passion fruit, and they lend guava, grapefruit, box tree, um, and in red cultivars, they can have, they can influence the berry and the floral characters as well. The methane thiols, although not strictly part of the, of the, grape contributors, um, I consider to be part of terroir because they are part of the winemaking practices of the region and the decisions on the, on the part of the winemaker. So for, for uh, tufuran methane thiol and benzene methane thiol, they're influenced by toasting. They have burnt uh, coffee, roasted coffee characteristics and, and sometimes impart um, chocolatey coffee characteristics to wines, which can be very attractive in some of the, of the red, red wines that are produced. Famously, Pinotage can have a coffee character, which is as a result of some of these compounds and the wood that is used. Our next group, which are very famous and a huge group of compounds, more than 50 are, are found in most wines, are the very important varietal identifiers, the monoterpenes which are found in Muscat, the Vertisramina, and the, the, the more floral, spicy, aromatic cultivars. The other famous monoterpene is Rotundo, which is the smell of black pepper, which is found in Shiraz. Norisoprenoids are a complex group of compounds that are also abundant in wines and have floral, um, exotic floral, violet, fruity, honey, and apple smells, which can be, can be really well expressed in some, in some South African wines. And then a group of compounds that are directly um, the responsibility or the production or arise as a result of fermentation and bacterial and the microbiological influence are the esters and higher alcohols. And you can see here an image that I got from, from a publication. The tech, um, credit is listed below. And these, the, the esters generally are very pleasant. And winemakers try to maximize these. And the microbiome of the vineyard and the natural microbiome will definitely affect these. But they will also affect the higher alcohols, which in higher concentrations are not very pleasant. So higher alcohols can lend chemical, solvent, um, quite acrid, and sometimes funky characteristics to wines, which, as I said, at low levels aren't bad, but at high levels can be a little off-putting. The group of compounds that I'm very interested in is the group on the left, the volatile phenols. My interest is, is as a result of, of fire and the impact of smoke if uh, events near vineyards, we have fain moss that needs to burn in order to be um, in order to reproduce and in order for new growth to come through. And uh, fire is a, is a big impact in our in our terroir. And uh, 
I argue strongly for the case that it should be considered to be part of our terroir, but I know that there are a lot of people who disagree with me. The other two, two compounds that might be of some interest is, uh, is 1,8-cineol, which is found in eucalyptus, quite famous in Kunawara in, in Australia, and also um, responsible for mintiness in some South African wine. And then uh, TDN, which is a compound that is found in Riesling that is grown in hot climates. Here is the paper that I was talking about by Van Leeuwen, who talks, who shows, and this is why I'm not going to spend time in this um, presentation talking about it because you can you can read this paper which really summarizes it rather beautifully um, talks about the incredible importance of vine nutrition status vine water status and stress and canopy management on some of these um, on some of these very important compounds and he also um, looks looks at winemaking practices and what can influence there. He doesn't really, um, or the authors don't really go into the microbiome, um, which is in becoming increasingly important, the non-saccharomyces varieties, natural fermentations, which lend really, really individual and important characters to wines um, when, when this is employed. But of course, if you want to express something, particularly in your wine, you would, you would use a specific yeast that is able to do that job for you. Um, and the wild fermentation or natural fermentation doesn't always give you a guaranteed result, but it was always interesting. Now I'm going to spend a little time looking at some cultivars. I've decided to do this in, in the way that I look at the cultivar and I look at the influence. And I'm also going to show you where the various areas are in, within the Western Cape. So we'll start out with Sauvignon Blanc. Uh, Sauvignon Blanc, I've just, I've just pulled out some examples here, but certainly there may be, there may be different um, and very, very excellent examples that are available in, in other places. But in my conversations with Andrew Shelley from WCT and with various other people, um, some, some wines were highlighted that came from, from, um, from these areas. So for Sauvignon Blanc, you can see here that clearly the Sauvignon Blanc, um, some of the, the interesting um, Sauvignon Blancs are coming out of, from areas that are very close to the coast, except for one. Um, which is the Picaneerskloof and the Citrusdal Mountains, which is right inland, but that is at a very high altitude. So, so really the, the, two, the two kind of not conflicting, but working together styles are the tropical fruit, which comes from warm climates typically, which is where your thiols are expressed, and then your methoxypyrazines, which is the green part of Sauvignon Blanc, which generally is affected by your, your cool temperatures, your shaded canopy, big vigorous vines, young vines. Um, and this is where um, these areas are, are the, cool, the cool sea influences in the south are bringing us this gorgeous blend of the, the green character and some of the warm thiols that are, that, that are coming out. So Citrus Del Mountain um, is, is producing some beautiful um, Sauvignon Blancs. Constantia is very well known, produces beautifully, beautifully balanced wines down here in the, in the south on the Cape Peninsula. Um, uh, the, the ripeness is dialed back and some of the vineyards are planted, planted not too high on the slope, but, but high enough that they get some altitude. And then we have Cape Point, which is, Supposedly, where the two seas, the Atlantic and the Indian, meet, but actually um, it's just surrounded by sea and gets very cool onshore, onshore breezes, as does Agullus, which is the furthest, the um, star that is furthest south, and, and Elam, and then the uh, Himalayana and the Elgin Valley. All of these places are producing wonderful Sauvignon Blancs with a great um, balance
between the green cool climate characteristics that we that we ex expect from Sauvignon Blanc and then the tropical fruit, which is also such a wonderful part of, of the Sauvignon Blanc character. One of the cultivars that, that um, has kind of been labeled a little bit as a South African classic is Chenin Blanc. Chenin Blanc is the very, very uh, uh, abundantly produced in South Africa in a wide range of areas. So there are wonderful examples of how this grape can express itself. And you can see from the map that the, the examples that we singled out, which are certainly not definitive, um, there are beautiful examples of Chenin Blanc from all over. Um, it's a neutral cultivar, so it reflects the winemaking practices and the effect of the vineyard microbiome really, really um, well. And where there's no inoculation of yeast, this, this effect of the, of the natural yeasts that are coming through, um, the concentration um, that comes from old vines and from bush vines that are grown in, in areas like Pikeniersklof, and then the natural salinity and minerality from areas like the West Coast really are expressed in Sauvignon Blanc because of its neutral character and its ability to be this, this creature of many disguises. Um, Stellenbosch also, I had to put in a photograph of the university because it is a very beautiful university. Um, Stellenbosch produces some wonderful examples, um, as does the Swartland. So you can see that there is a huge range here from the West Coast, uh, right next to the cold Benguela current, to Pekineerskloof, right up in the mountains, old vines, to Stellenbosch, which is generally a, warm, a warmer region, but with, with uh, sea breezes and the southeaster affecting it, and then to, to the Swartland, which has some old vines and wonderful, wonderful winemaking, really interesting novel winemaking that's going on, which really tries to express the grape. And uh, I know that Eben said the other day that he's still trying to understand Chenin Blanc, and I thought that was a wonderful thing to say. Um, the next cultivar is also a kind of workhorse cultivar, a neutral variety that expresses the winemaking beautifully. Um, it's a little more challenging to grow than, than Chenin Blanc because it does require some really cold conditions um, in, in winter to thrive, to thrive properly. And therefore the areas where, where you know, Chardonnay is excelling. Um, for example, the Cedarberg gets extremely cold at night and produces absolutely crystalline examples of, of, of Chardonnay, expressing the terroir so beautifully. And then a, an area like Bredekloof, which is further inland and therefore has much greater diurnal temperature variation because you don't get the influence of the sea so much. And that is, is producing some beautiful Chardonnays as well. And you can see that the, the, you know, the type of farming is very different in these areas. And the approach, the winemaking approaches are very different. Hellswichter, which literally means as high as hell, is, is an area of Stellenbosch, which has, has where the vines are planted. I visited Hellswichter um, a while ago and went up to the top of one of the vineyards in a Land Rover. I, I was absolutely terrified. I mean, I thought the Land Rover was gonna go over backwards, but these vines are planted on, on slopes and, uh, and some beautiful, beautiful examples are coming, are coming out of, of Hellswichter. The, the grape shows excellent acidity, persistence of flavor, elegance. And then down in the south in the Himalayan Arda Valley, we have, um, and in Elgin and, and Elam, we have Chardonnays that are expressing single, single vineyard characters. Um, Almondcat Chardonnay, for example, is beautiful, pure, restrained, and Craig Vessel's Restless River Chardonnay um, expresses the natural fermentation in the oak absolutely amazingly. So beautiful examples of Chardonnay, one of my favorite grapes. Um, coming out of South Africa. 
The next grape is Cabernet, which, which one would think would be, well, it is absolutely ideally suited to South African growing conditions. And the examples that we chose and, and looked, looked at were, some of them seem to be pretty normal, and the other, the other one is a little bit out of the box. So Paul, Halswichter, and Stellenbosch Golden Triangle, um, which is an area of the Blauklippen Road, um, a beautiful, beautiful valley, where, which is where I've, I've shown it on the map, which is where these wines are grown, really express the, really produce the conditions where Cabernet can express itself the best. So absolutely gorgeous, um, extensive plantings of Cabernet um, and good aromas. Uh, limestone soils of the Robertson region add, add, um, add interesting characters too. And you, we get our full phenolic ripeness in, in, um, in, our, in our Cabernet. So the Golden, the golden Triangle, Clan is also is producing amazing Cabernet for the, for the price. And, uh, and I included Yemenal and Arda because cool regions can also produce good, good cabs, um, but they have a much more restrained quality. So the fruit, the fruit isn't, isn't as, uh, as dominant. They have a very, very long, slow ripening. And sometimes the grapes are only picked in May, which is sort of well after the normal picking period in, in South Africa. Um, and Paul is producing some stunning Cabernet examples. Niederberg is a very well-known producer there. Then Shiraz and Syrah, also similar. Um, we have similar styles to the Northern Rhone. They're not overly alcoholic in style, um, but initially the New World went a bit over-oaked and over-extracted. But the Syrahs that are coming out of South Africa now are very restrained and reined back. So the Swartland is showing some amazing Shiraz winemaking. Grapes are picked slightly earlier um, and the wines show wonderful freshness. And then Stellenbosch, again, the Golden Triangle area, um, shaded mountain slopes are restraining the, the, the ripening period and cooling, cooling the ripening period off a little. So you're getting wonderful wines coming out of there. And then interestingly, Elam and Elgin in the south are also showing lovely um, Shiraz. It's not very vast volumes, but they produce wonderful peppery Shirazes because rot rotundone actually is expressed more, more thoroughly when the grapes are shaded and, and when they are cooler. Then I know one that everybody is very interested in is Pinotage. And it's kind of the grape cape, the cape grape, the grape cape, the cape grape. It is a, a crossing of Hermitage and Pinot Noir, des, and, and that was um, designed, if you like, or crossed by Prof. Pierrot in 1925. And this crossing has, has really, it's very successful in South Africa. It probably doesn't express as much of the Pinot Noir character, and people are trying to get that out. But it produces lots of plums, black currants, cherries, tannin, alcohol, and... Uh, Famously, one of the identifiers is banana, um, which we try to get away from uh, in South Africa because banana can, as the wine ages, lead to a bit of a, a duco character. But it is producing some wonderful, and you can see examples there from Stellenbosch, the Simonsberg, Kanonkop, and Bayerskloof, very famously. And then Paul. I drank a white pinotage from Paul from, from Malasat. Um, that just blew me away. It, I, it had never occurred to me that a white pinotage could, could, could produce such amazing um, expression of the fruit, but there you go. So pinotage rosés are becoming more popular and the grape is certainly not what it used to be. It is really being made in a beautiful, characterful way that expresses the terroir. Then the last two um, grapes that I that I want to talk about a little bit is Pinot Noir, which isn't necessarily you know on par with with what's being produced in France. I don't think that can be easily, but perhaps we need to move away from trying to imitate France and come up with our own our own ideas and our own expression. Um, it's not grown in huge um, amounts, but the Himmel and Arda Valley, 
and Elbe in the cool regions of South Africa are producing some lovely examples of Pinot Noir with the, and the sea breezes and the altitude um, contribute to the, to the savoriness and the minerality and the, and the truffle complexity of, of the grape. And then Merlot is steadily improving as a cultivar wine, but it's mainly used for blends. We have a bit of a problem with the pyrazine character in, in, in South Africa, the greenness in Merlot, but it is gradually being reined back and we are now starting to produce some beautiful wines. Stellenbosch, the Leibach organic vineyard, Elgin Shannon produces wonderful Merlot and the Helderberg region as well. And then Wellington also produces fabulous, fabulous examples. So that is my presentation on South African varietal character and the, the, the compounds and the expression of it. Obviously, this is not definitive. I have left out and hundreds of wines that are that are much better uh, or, or, or just as good, if not better, that perhaps I haven't heard of yet because people are trying new things all the time. Also, we haven't talked about the other varietals that are being made, which are incredible. We haven't talked about the fact that drought resistant cultivars are starting to be planted as a result of climate change. And the experiments that are, are coming out with those white and red are very exciting and, and really to be watched. And then we haven't talked about the other styles of wine and the very famous products that are coming out of South Africa, like Brandy, Jerapika, and our port, port and sherry style wines, their noble lace harvests and our muscadels. So there is an awful lot to discover. And uh, I really invite you to come and try um, our South African wines. I'd like to acknowledge Andrew Shelley of the Wine and Spirits Education Trust for his invaluable tasting expertise in, in helping me to single out some interesting areas. Um, and he also gave me the opportunity to taste um, Ardy Bardenhorst's two vineyards um, of Chen Blanc that are right next to each other and, and to different express different things just because of the soil. So that was a very interesting experience. So thank you very much. And I look forward to engaging with you on the questions later. There are some references if anyone's interested. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Mackay. That was um, fascinating and such an, an attractive uh, presentation and, and um, really uh, informative. Uh, you managed to bring um, very technical, um, complex information um, across, but it was in a very digestible and understandable way for what's mostly a lay audience here. So, so thank you so much. It was, it was really um, very much in, very informat uh, informative. So from the overview, uh, that Dr. Mackay gave um, of the Cape wine region and of um, famous cultivars of the Cape wine region. We now get to hear from some specific um, wine estates. Um, we will have a session next where um, five uh, wineries will um, introduce their produce and tell us about, about the estates and, and, and the produce. We were supposed to uh, have a, a sixth um, uh, estate also join us, that's um, Heis van uh, Chevalerie, but unfortunately um, they won't be joining us this morning. So we will start with Misha Estate in Wellington and um, we will have Mr. Andrew Barnes, who's the proprietor of Misha Estate, tell us about the wine estate. Mr. Barnes. Hi. Morning. Morning. Uh, are you guys gonna play? Uh, we, we, uh, do you want us to share your presentation? I'm uh, here with uh, Professor, Professor Hunter. Here we go. Yeah. I'm here with Professor Hunter, uh, who uh, is a viticultural practice and helping us uh, constantly improve our, our quality. So, um, I'd just like to thank him for, for being here. In terms of background uh, on our farm, uh, we are a third generation uh, wine farm. Uh, we have a very 
unique terroir in terms of uh, being on the slopes of Grunberg. Uh, we are fortunate that Grunberg has recently been recognized as a, as a ward. Uh, so, so that makes us one of the newest, smallest appellations in South Africa at this point of time, which is uh, uh, something that's quite an achievement from my point of view, because the demarcation committee doesn't very easily uh, demarcate new areas unless they, they really think there's something significant uh, within that region. So being recognized in that way is very important to us. Um, we also are a commercial vine nursery, so we graft and grow a lot of the vines that uh, we supply to the industry, which gives us quite a broad background uh, from a viticultural point of view, knowing what clones, cultivars, rootstocks are performing well throughout the country, which uh, then again educates the vineyards that we plant uh, for our own wines. Um, in terms of winemaking practice, uh, we're very minimalist. We try to focus all of our effort and energy into our vineyards and getting maximum expression out of our terroir. Uh, so my, my winemaking philosophy is very simple. It's great barrel bottle. Uh, that's pretty much all we do. Uh, so yeah, that's a bit of background. Professor, would you like to add a few words on, on the vineyards? No, I think that what Andrew said is quite true. Um, we let the grapes uh, speak for, for themselves. So whatever is, is grown in the, in the vineyards must be relating to the wines finally. And this is what we are trying to do. So all the composition, everything must relate into the wines. And this is, this is the objective, to be as natural as possible, to grow the best grapes uh, that we can on the farm and then to translate that into the, into the wines. Thank you very much. Um, uh, so that's, that's, that's all, um, your background to the, to the estate. Could I ask you, Mr. Barnes, what's your favorite from, of, of, what you, of what you produce? <laughs> Yeah, that's a very difficult question. That's like saying, which is your favorite child? Um, the, uh, we're very fortunate in that we produce far more grapes than we put in the bottle. We also uh, sell to a number of private buyers for their, for their own labels. Uh, so uh, I'm fortunate uh, as a winemaker to be able to really cherry pick the vineyards and the grapes that I use. So I literally only choose the best. Um, so it's, it's hard to say what my favorite is, but in terms of... Uh, um, which we say commercial success, our Merlot does very well for us. Uh, we were rated one of the top 10 Merlots uh, actually this year, uh, which is great recognition. So our Merlots do well in terms of awards and commercially, so, so that's great. Um, my favorites are the kind of our more experimental wines because those are a bit more, you know, more fun. Um, so we, we do uh, a Grenache, uh, which I actually struggled struggled with for for many years it took me six vintages before i felt like the quality was sufficient to bottle uh and i've been struggling with it for quite a while and it was fantastic recognition to get our first platter five star uh, ever for for that grenache so that that, that was a very long road that uh, that uh, we were you know we're very happy to, to have got it to that point uh, one of my favorite cultivars that i'm hoping to do more with um, is malbec I think our, our Malbec does fantastically well. Uh, so we're gonna be doing some new plantings and expanding on that. Um, and then one of the cultivars that I think uh, needs to get more recognition in the industry, specifically commercially, is Petty Sura. I think it's really uniquely uh, suited to South Africa uh, and especially the commercial growing conditions. I think uh, it can make a high quality wine under high yielding uh, conditions. Uh, you know, which is something we need in terms of, uh, you know, the, the volume part of the South African wine industry. You know, so, so what I try to do with, with our Petit Syrah is, is actually make a more elegant version uh, because it's generally quite a big, strong, robust wine. Uh, so, that's, so that's very interesting and, and, and challenging. Um, and then, you know, to answer your question, I would have to say our uh, oh, my, my favorite wine is actually um, a, a new project uh, wine I'm making with uh, Professor Hunter called the Ring Fence that we haven't we haven't actually released yet. It's in the bottle, but we haven't released it. 
um, which is which has kind of been a passion project and a culmination of what I don't even know what six, seven, eight, I don't know what many, many years of working together uh, and fighting in the vineyards. And at last we agreed actually uh, we've we've made something good enough to put in the bottle. So uh, yeah, that would be my favorite. All right, thank you, Mr. Barnes. Um, you, your passion for your craft uh, comes across uh, very clearly. Thank you. Uh, we now next have a uh, with Mr. Bulan Kherb. So I just trying to unmute my screen. Where's my unmute button? Uh, we can hear you, so so you have. Okay, fantastic, fantastic. I just want to get my PowerPoint presentation going, and then I'm going to quickly share uh, share that screen. Mm, give me one sec, sorry. I'll quickly share my screen with you. Perfect. Sorry for uh, for the for taking so long. So yeah, hi, my my name is Bula Um I'm the winemaker at Kruppe Sancho. I'm the oldest wine from in South Africa. Um, we're very proud of our history, dating back to 1685. Um, Kruppe Sancho has an uninterrupted history that goes back more than 330 years. So please allow me a minute to tell you more about the history of this beautiful estate. Um, um, so, so the first owner of Kruger Sancha, or just Constantia as the farm was known back then, was the first governor of the Cape. In 1685, Simon van der Stel founded Constantia Wine Farm. Um, as Dr. McKay uh, uh, mentioned earlier, um, you know, the, the, the Cape of Guido uh, served as a halfway station to supply provisions for boats traveling around Africa. Um, and the small community in the Cape were not really experienced farmers. So van der Stel's intention with Constantia was to serve as a model farm for the other settlers um, in the Cape at the time. Um, interesting enough, there's a lot of talk about terroir. Um, you know, Van Estelle asked his team to collect soil samples around the Cape Peninsula, um, which he sent to, to, to Amsterdam for analysis. And based on the analysis of the soil, uh, Van Estelle decided to establish this model form, farm in the, in the area that is known as, um, as Constantia today. Um, Van Estelle passed away in 1712, just a bit more history, which I find interesting. The original farm was subdivided. The core of the farm with a manor house and the operational buildings. It was, uh, it was renamed as Hood Constantia. Farm changed hands a few times. Interesting, a freed slave um, by the name of Anna de Koning was the third owner in uh, 1724. And then the Kluter family that made Constantia famous, they acquired the property in 1778. Um, the sweet giant of Constantia received international acclaim for its quality in the 18th century. Um, and it became known throughout the world as just Constantia wine. Um, this Constantia wine was bought by Euro European courts, you know, the 18th century, uh, in preference to uh, Sauternes, and Kaiser and Madeira, according to the, uh, the wine author, Hugh Johnson. Um, so from Frederick the Great, from Prussia to King Louis Philippe of France, they all, um, they all competed for their share of Constantia wine. Um, British author Charles Dickens uh, wrote about it in Edwin Drood. Um, also, British author Jane Austen uh, spoke about uh, um, Constantia wine as a cure for a broken heart and sense of sensibility. Um, uh, the French uh, poet uh, Boulele spoke about Constantia wines, and I think probably the most famous of them all, Napoleon Bonaparte, that uh, requested Constantia wine while in exile in Saint Helena. Um, the, um, the sweet wine that made Constantia famous in the 18th century was carefully recreated a few decades ago. Um, we actually used chemical analysis of that 18th century Constantia wine uh, in combination with notes from the journals of the clip that you reproduce our the Grand Constance today in the style as close as possible to, to the historical wines. From that slide, you can see the, the, the picture of the, of the packaging. Even the packaging today is a replica of a 1774 Constantia bottle that was discovered in Delaware in the USA in 2004. So we really tried to get as close as possible to that old uh, legend Constantia wine of the 18th century. Um, um, uh, again, uh, Dr. McKay referred to the unique climate of the Western Cape. Um, Constantia produce uh, quite a range of wines situated. You can see there on the left, just on the top of the picture, you'll see uh, the, the, the back of Table Mountain. Constantia is 
um, literally wedged in uh, um, in, in the, um, the, the Atlantic Ocean on the one side, false Bay on the other side. So we have that very strong maritime influence, um, very unique topography. Also, you can see on the right there all the slopes and angles that we have there. So it really is quite a unique pocket that we have here in, um, in the Constantia Valley that allows us to produce a really uh, uh, great range of wine. Um, the range of wine is quite big. You can see we produce from uh, French uh, or Champagne style Cap uh, dry whites and reds, all the way to uh, fortified and natural sweet wines. Um, however, our focus is definitely dry whites, Sauvignon Blanc from Chardonnay, Chardonnay probably are our, 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 our best known white wines and red wines, um, Pinotage, Shiraz and our Cabernet, Lead Cabernet Reserve are, um, are probably our focus on the, on the red side. Um, we are very conscious of our role in environmental sustainability. Um, we are on the, uh, on the border of Table Mountain National Park. So minimizing our footprint, including our carbon footprint and water management are two areas that we, very, uh, that, that we focus on. Uh, being a WWF champion, uh, conservation champion, biodiversity is very important to us. Um, you know, we acknowledge as environmental leaders in the wine industry for our commitment to conservation as a WWF conservation champion. You know, this includes production practices, integrated management systems, um, innovation in water and energy efficiency and climate adaptation. So that is something that we, uh, that is very close to our hearts. Um, our rich history and our geographical location obviously make Constantia um, very popular as a, as a tourist destination. Um, we are only 20 minutes away from Cape Town city centre. Uh, we are also on that uh, city sightseeing bus, also known as Hop on Hop Off bus route. Um, we have two restaurants on the farm, large, uh, two large private uh, tasting rooms and a few museums. So there's, uh, there's plenty to keep, the, um, to keep our, uh, our guests busy. Uh, before COVID, now we were up to just under a half million visitors per year. So it was a, it's a very popular um, uh, tourist destination. So yeah, so that's it. Me in a nutshell, thank you very much for your time and hope to see you on the farm soon. Um, any questions? Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Bulas. So I think um, we've, we've asked uh, people to post questions um, and then we will engage those questions afterwards. So um, Perfect. We, we won't be taking any questions now, but of course, uh, Kruit Constantia is, as you as you say, say one of the, the, the key landmarks um, in uh, in Cape Town. Uh, next, we have Dufre uh, in, in Stellenbosch, and that's with Mr. Retief de Toué. Hi, uh, let me just share screen here. At the Frey, we produce site-specific wines driven by our terroir. In the photo, you see the green vineyard of the Frey with the Simonsberg in the background. All of the Frey's vineyards have a western aspect with a gentle slope giving the vineyards an almost solar panel-like exposure, assuring optimal ripeness. We believe that terroir is not only a function of the land, but also of people, winemaking techniques, and also very importantly, a collective memory and wisdom gained from previous harvests. We have a total commitment to quality with brand equity worth more to us than short-term financial gain. At the Freer, we believe that the best fertilizer is the shadow of the owner. We have three permanent employees working in the vineyards with Stefan and great emphasis is put on continuous improvement of skill and understanding of the vines. Our approximate 12,500 vines are cared for individually. Apart from our land and our people, this is our most valuable asset. Without healthy vines, it is impossible to produce good fruit, and without good fruit, you cannot make good wine. Our aim is to produce top quality fruit in an environmentally responsible way. We produce approximately 30,000 bottles of wine per annum with a singular focus on quality. Apart from the Blanc de Noir, a wine is made only from the fruit of vines that we farm ourselves. Single cultivar wines are made from Cabernet Sauvignon, Mouvert and Sauvignon Blanc. We also produce a Bordeaux and a Rhone style blend as well as a Blanc de Noir made from Mouvert. The wine is made with a process of low intervention and barrel maturation is done with patience and with respect to the wine. 
Our commitment to you is an unwavering pursuit of the best quality wine our terroir can provide. If you have any questions or if you would like to obtain more information about De Freire, you can visit our website or you can contact me at my email address. We thank Ambassador Moriyama and his team for this opportunity to present our business to you and we also thank you for your patience and time. Thank you very much, Mr. Dutue. I did wonder about the name, but then it became clear uh, at the end of your presentation um, why your estate is, 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 has the name it has. Unfortunately, I cut off the first slide. Um, it's a steep yeah. learning curve with a, with a Zoom store. Yes, no, no, it's a thank you. That, that was, a, was excellent. Um, okay. Thank you. And uh, the next estate we will have is Alles Verloren with Mr. Wilhelm de Vries. Wilhelm, I wonder whether um, your sound is on. Very sorry about that. Um, oh, so right, good day. Um, oh, it's right. my pleasure to introduce you to the Alice Verloren Estate Wines. Um, we are based in Ribic West in the Swatland region of South Africa. Our winters are cold and wet with warm, dry summers, uh, where our grapes ripen easily with high sugars and great concentrations of flavor. As the farm uh, ranges from 170 meters to 350 meters above sea level, the grapes and therefore the wine flavor composition differs and give us a great range of flavors and extracts to work with in the cellar. The Alice Fleurin brand are built on decades of history, tradition, pride, and dedication. We pride ourselves in making unique still and fortified wines. Our wines are intended to be enjoyed with large variety of cuisine. So who are we? we who are we as a brand? So the name Alles Verloren means all is lost. The reason being that the entire farm was burned to the ground in, in 1696 and subsequently all was lost. The name Alles Verloren was given um, to the farm in 1704. The name is a reminder that we rose from the ashes to build a successful family owned wine estate. The farm Alice Verloren has been in the Milan family since 1872, and Farney Milan is the sixth generation Milan to manage Alice Verloren. The first wine was produced on Alice Verloren in 1806, and the Milan family have been making wine commercially since um, 1960. Alice Verloren is also the oldest wine estate in the Swartland. I'm just quickly um, going to go through the Alice Verloren wine range. Uh, Alice Verloren wine range from a uh, Chenin Blanc, uh, Rosé, six dry red wines, two fortified wines, and I will now quickly um, go one by one. So the Chenin Blanc uh, is a crisp, clean, unwooded Chenin Blanc, uh, true to the Swartland, which is well known to my great Chenin Blancs. It's medium bodied, ripe stone fruit, elegant finish with balanced acidity. Now Tinta Rosé, our rosé is made in the Provence style. Uh, it consists of a blend of five cultivars, namely Tinta Barocca, Terriga Nacional, Shiraz, Merlot, and Petit Verdot. Each cultivar gives a unique flavor to the rosé um, without one dominating the other. This ensures a well-balanced rosé with, um, with a full, well-rounded mouthfeel. I personally think the rose Tinta rosé will, uh, will do very well in Japan, as from my understanding, Rosé wells do well in Japan, especially in the summer. Allure, it's a luring rosé with strawberries and raspberries on the nose, cherries and vanilla on the palate. Our 1704, it's a soft, elegant um, structure. This is a, the first of two red blends in our range. This is a blend between Tinta Barocca and Shiraz. We make this wine to be more consumer driven and is aimed at everyday enjoyment. It's got some red berries cherries, and spiced cedar oak. It's complex and remarkably drinkable. 
Next wine is our uh, Terriga Nacional, the first of two single cultivar Portuguese wines. The wine has berry, plum, and mulberry on the nose with a firm a mouthfeel. Age in second and third full barrels for eight months. It's got a raisin, a raisin and black currant on the nose, vanilla and oak spice on the palate, and a velvety with firm tannic, and it's velvety with firm tannic structure. Tinta Barocca. This Portuguese red is one of our best known. It, is fla it has flavors of black plums, purple flowers, and black cherries. Traditionally a Portuguese varietal, it's 18 months in oak, medium to full bodied wine, intense berry fruit and supple oak spice, tannin structured and linger on the, on the finish. Our um, Shiraz, it's a typical Swatland Shiraz with rich, distinct flavors and intense mouthfeel. A generous, full bodied wine, smoky, scented bouquet, and well structured with ample ripe fruit flavors. A Cabernet Sauvignon, um, our best performing wine in South Africa. Notes of green pepper and berry with a good tannin on the palate. Intensely flavored, matured for 12 months in oak. Good tannin structure, blackcurrant cherries with undertones of dark chocolate. Then our estate wine, or our flagship wine, is our Tres Vermelos. So, Tres Vermelos, this is our flagship wine. Um, it is a blend between three Portuguese cultivars, namely Tinta Barocca, Terriga Nacional, and Suzal. We just talked about the Tinta Barocca and Terriga Nacional uh, on their own, but the Suzal um, is something special and gives this wine intense dark color, berry and mocha flavors with heavy tannins. The uh, Tres Vermelos is blended before aging in 300 liter barrels for 18 months and two years. It has a mixture of spice and, and floral notes, different from anything you, have, uh, you are used to. Truly an interesting wine. Now the fine old vintage, um, the Alice Fluren fine old vintage is, a, is probably the best known South African port style fortified wine. It's made in the vintage port style with the typical fruit and spice flavors as one would expect. It's got some raisins, coffee and mocha on the nose, prune, raisin, orange peel and vanilla on the palate. It's got a great balance between acidity and alcohol. And then um, something to, to end the day off with is our red muscadel. It's got an elegant, it's an elegant sweet wine, excellent balance and a lovely freshness, well integrated balance of acidity and pH. Wonderfully, a wonderful array of rich berries and spice on the palate. So you're probably wondering why we make so many Portuguese varietals, uh, farm with the Portuguese varietals. Um, so the fourth generation, Fani Milan, imported the first Portuguese varietals to South Africa to improve the quality of our port style wines. I believe the wines made from Portuguese cultivars in South Africa has more complexity and fruit compared to the wines made in Portugal. So we aim to make wine that bring people together. We make memories, we make friends for the love of wine. Thank you, everybody. You are more than welcome to contact me on the email shown on the, on the screen at this time. Thank you very much, uh, Wilhelm. Um, last but not least, we've got Ms. Jenna Bruyère who's the marketing manager at Springfield Estate in Robertson. Jenna? Hello, hello. Oh, let's just get there. There we go. Hello, let me just share my screen. Perfect. So hello, everyone. My name is Jenna Bruver kruger and I am from Springfield Estate. So Springfield Estate is set in the heart of the mountain ring Robertson Valley in South Africa's Western Cape province. Um, Springfield is a vibrant family run farm. It's actually my family's farm that has been in our family since 1898. So it's owned by my family, the Bruver family. We are fourth generation wine farmers and ninth generation descendants of the French Huguenots who came to South Africa over 200 years ago. The farm itself is picturesque 
A uh, tree-lined road meanders right up to the cellar complex, which is flanked by a dam complete with a small sailing boat, which we actually learned to sail on as children. And there are magnificent, magnificent views of the mountain range of McGregor and Langeberg Mountains behind Robertson. The lime-rich soil in the estate ranges from extremely rocky to clay, with sandy soil next to the Breda River. The climate in the area can be harsh and extreme. We have a very large diurnal temperature range, with temperatures reaching about 30, 35 degrees in summer daytimes, but dropping as low as 6 degrees Celsius at nighttime. We have a very low annual rainfall of around 200 millimeters per year, which means that we need to apply controlled irrigation using dripper irrigation. And this is essential for our vines to survive. So our wines at Springfield Estate are mostly made from single vineyards um, using natural yeast, which grows on the skins of the grapes. So we do not add anything during the fermentation process. It ferments spontaneously. A new vineyard is a 20 year investment and therefore the utmost care is taken when preparing the soil for a new site. We plant about 10 hectares of new vineyard every year to maintain our renewal process. Once the vineyard is established, it will bear fruit in its second year and can continue to do, to do so for a lifetime if properly looked after. In summer, we harvest using mechanical harvesting machines and we start at 2 a.m. when the temperatures are at their lowest. This ensures that our grapes remain crisp and cold and are in the cellar within 20 minutes of being picked, which beats the African summer heat. So we get the grapes in when they're still cold. So here's just a video showing our um, harvesting process. This was done in 2018, so pre-COVID. <laughs> Sorry, I just, are you hearing the music during this? We, we do hear the music. Uh, oh, okay, cool. it's yes. like prompting me to change settings. I'm a bit of a technological vessel here. Yeah. So I'm going to the next slide. Ooh. 
sorry. Let me just get out of this full screen. Um, there we go. So uh, we produce a variety of premium wines that are very well loved both locally and abroad. At the moment, we do about 70% of our wines are sold in South Africa and about 30% are exported to 28 different countries. Uh, we are probably most well known for our Sauvignon Blanc, the Life from Stone, which is grown in the very rocky soil, as well as our Holberry, which is a Cabernet Sauvignon. So these are the most widely available um, that you might be able to find. So all of our red wines are aged in French oak barrels for a minimum of one year. Most of them are aged for two years. These barrels are racked every three months, which removes the excess sediment and allows us to bottle the wine unfiltered and unfined. After bottling, our wines are matured for one to four years prior to release. We believe that there's nothing worse than drinking a wine too young and therefore we age the wine for our customers. So here's my second video for the day. I've got some multimedia entertainment. <laughs> so this is just a day in winter when we are pruning and busy uh, with the winemaking process with the red wines. Okay, let's see if I can get out of here quicker. There we go. Um, so like I said, our wines are sold directly from our cellar, as well as in 28 countries around the world. Um, they fly first class with Lufthansa and with British Airways, and they are served on luxury cruise liners and in Michelin starred restaurants across the world. Our tasting room, which is heaven on earth this time of year, it has a beautiful deck overlooking the dam, uh, the perfect way to spend an afternoon. We are lucky to call this beautiful estate home and invite all of you to visit us when you are next in South Africa. So thank you everyone for your time. Um, here are our social media channels if anyone wants to follow us, especially our Instagram provides quite a lot of information and stories about the wine. So please do connect and yeah, look forward to hearing any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Jenna. That, that, was, that was lovely. I uh, really enjoyed that. Um, I know that Andrew Barnes from Miche Estate wanted to share a video um, and we were hoping to play that video that was uh, pre-recorded, but we've had some technical difficulty with that video. So we will um, share the video afterwards uh, with, with all participants. Um, and time is also moving on. So, so let us um, now move to the um, final session uh, for this morning, uh, which is a discussion which is organized as a Q&A session.
with, with Ms. Yasuko Nagoshi. Ms. Nagoshi is a journalist working with WANS. Uh, WANS is the international wines and spirit magazine for the trade in Japan. Uh, Ms. Nagoshi worked uh, for a wine importer, and after that, she became a freeline, freelance wine journalist. Um, she then ran a web magazine uh, called Wine Press Japan, and later joined WANS, where she's now working in 2015, and she's been president and publisher of WANS um, magazine since 2017. So Ms. Nagoshi is going to be interviewed by Mr. Norio Mariyama, who is uh, the ambassador of Japan to South Africa. So can I please ask uh, Ambassador Mariyama and Ms. Nagoshi um, if you could, um, if you could uh, turn on your cameras and uh, we could start the discussion. あの、皆さんこんにちは。あの、ご紹介にあずかりました南アフリカであの大使を一人いますマリアマです。え、今日はですね、あの、非常にあの、興味深いあのウェビナーをあの開催させていただいておりまして、またあの、様々な方々のあ
以前よりも、まあ、これ世界的な傾向と同じで、えー、辛口タイプのものが好まれるようになってきていると思います。ただ一方であのごく甘口のシャンパーニュスパークリングワインも一部の層でものすごく受けているのでまあ一口には言えないということになりますそして、えー、量的に最も売れている価格帯これは500円から1000円台1000円までですねでただあのやっぱり産地特性や品種の特性があの明確に現れる表現されるワインっていうのはだいたいまあ1000円台以上のものというのもあのこれも事実です、えー、なのでまあどの価格帯で勝負したいかっていうのはそれぞれワイナリーさんの得意とするレンジがあると思いますので、えー、まあその輸入元さんが決まられたらば、輸入元さんが得意とする流通網というのもありますので、その接点で決めていかれるのが良いかと思います。ありがとうございます。大変あの参考になるあの話だと思います。少しあの中身は被るかもしれませんけれども、私もよく聞かれるのはですね、日本であの人気のあるワインの特徴だとか、何かあの生産地、生産国で、あのそういうものがあるのかということをよく聞かれます。この点はいかがでしょうか。はい、えっ、ー、と生産地やあの生産国種類についてはあのまあもし本当に日本市場にご興味があれば。これは昔の紙のものなんですが、私たちでウォンズレビューというあの英文のニュースレター、日本,の、まあ、日本市場についてあの作成していますので、まあ、それをあのご購読いただければ、よりあの詳細なデータというのは見ていただけると思います。でえー、と長年ですね輸入量として、えー、第1位の、えー、国というのはフランスだったんですね。えー、なんですが、えー、2015年以降はチリが追い抜いて1位になって、えー、それを、あのー、維持しています。でただ今年はもしかするともう一回フランスが返り咲く可能性もあるという状態です。であのフランスがずっと優勢だったというのはあのおそらくかつてですねフランス食品振興会という団体があり、まあ、昔ソペクサと呼んでいた団体ですね公的な団体があのプロモーションがあの非常に熱心になさっていてで、えー、日本で,です日本であの非常に数多くの優秀なソムリエ人をですね育てていらっしゃったんですね。なのでそれが、えー、大きな要因の一つではないかと思います。で、えー、と今でも日本ではボルドー、ブルゴーニュ、シャンパーニュ、えー、この産地というのはワイン好きの,あの大きな憧れの的でもあります。まあ、これ、日本だけではないとは思いますけれど、でそれえー、ただですね、最近はあの、えー、ご存知のように他国ですね、特にまあ南アフリカも含む新世界、から非常にあの品質が高くユニークなワインが続々と輸入されていますのであのフランス勢もちょっと押され気味なところでですねなので逆にあのフランス勢も負けないようにプロモーションまた強化されているという印象ですそしてえっ、ー、と現在1位のチリは、えー、圧倒的なコフトコストパフォーマンスの高さで伸長しているんですけれどもただあの反対に2000円以上のプレミアムレンジがあのなかなか思ったように販売促進できないということで今非常に苦労されていますただあの徐々に伸びてきているようですねで、えー、次に3番目ですね現在3位はイタリアですで日本ではあの一時期イタ,リアワイあイタリア料理店の数がものすごく伸びましたでその、えー、イタリア料理店の増加とともに、えー、イタリアワインの輸入量も増えましたで、えー、ただここ78年ですねイタリア料理店の,あの数が、えー、結構飽和状態になってきていましてそれでイタリア料理店以外の飲食店ですとかオフトレードへの進出というのをあの余儀なくされていて、ユニモトさんたちも、えー、頑張っていらっしゃると
そして4番目はスペインです。でスペインもですね一定な一定の,あのコアなファンというのを獲得していらっしゃるんですがあのイメージとして安くて美味しいという意味あのスペインワインは安く,安くて美味しいというイメージが非常に強くついてしまっていて、えー、それでもってあの中古価格帯の伸びがあのなかなかうまくいかないとでこれも苦労されていますであ,のあくまで客観的なあの意見なんですがあのまあ、他国と比べてしまうとちょっと情報発信がそれほどお上手ではないのかなという印象です。ありがとうございます。お話を伺っていると、うん、なるほどなんとなくあの攻め込む余地は南アフリカのワインにありそうだなという感じが私はあの<笑>してきました。あのそれでですねあのよくこれまたあの受ける質問なんですけども。要するにまあ赤ワインが好きなのか白ワインが好きなのかという話なんですがあの日本の消費者っていうのはやっぱりあの赤ワインを好む傾向にあるんでしょうかあの赤ワインと白ワインであの消費傾向に日本の,場合の消費者の場合ってやっぱり違いはありますでしょうか、はいえーとまあ、フレンチパラドクスの話からですねあの赤ワインブームというのがありました。えー、95年1995年ぐらいですね。で、そのところからあのワインに親しんでいた、あのまあ、あのちょっと年齢層が高い、まあえー、50代ですね、50代以上、私たち世代っていうのが、あの50代以上っていうのが日本ワインの消費の今、60% だと。言われれてるんですけれどもその世代は今でも赤ワインを好む傾向が強いようで,でしかも比較的重厚なタイプを好む傾向だと言われてます。でただあの若年層ですねはあの白も赤も比較的軽快で,でナチュラルなワインを好む人が多いというふうに聞いています。で,、えー、ですのであの赤白の割合をあのに関するデータっていうのはあの特にないんですけれども今はおよそ半々ぐらいだろうというふうに思われます、うん、ありがとうございますあの南アフリカの場合はですね赤ワインも白ワインもいいんですけどまたスパークリングワインがなかなか素晴らしいものはたくさんあると思うんですあの南アのですねそれこそあのオーセンティックなあのスパークリングワインっていうのはそうですね日本だったらどのような方に好まれると思われますかえー、スパークリングワイン、本当あの素晴らしいですね。あの先だってもちょっとセ,セミナーを受けさせていただきました。はいでえー、とスパークリングワインだけのデータというものは特にないんですけれどもあのやっぱり本格的な特に MCC でしたらばターゲそのターゲットはあの、まあ、これまでシャンパーニュに慣れ親しんできた方。あそういった層が近いのだと思います。で、えー、で若干女性の方が多いかもしれませんし、えー、年齢層としては40代以上が、えー、主体かと思います。えー、また、えー、と価格で言えば、小売価格が5000円を超える、えー、スパークリングワインというのは、オントレードの方が、えー、主体。でそれよりもお安くなるとオフトレードが主体になってきます。うん、ありがとうございます。えっと、先ほどあの、まあ、ワインを好む世代の話になりましたけどももう少しあの細かくですねあの日本ではまあワインを飲む人の、まあ、年齢層っていうのは大体どれくらいになってるかっていうのをちょっともう一度教えてください。はいえー、およそでですね50代以上で 60% を飲んじゃってるようですね。それして40代で 19%。で、20代と30代を合わせて 21% というふうに言われてます。わ、うん、かりました。それでその若い世代がだんだんとはむしろ軽めのものが赤白問わずに好きだということをよく理解しました。それでですね、あの、えーとまあ、ワインの飲み方、先ほどもあのワインは食中酒ということをおっしゃいましたけれども、やはりあのこれあの日本ワインは西洋料理と一緒に飲まれるのが主流なのか、それとも日本のワインなので、伝統的な和食とも飲まれるのかというのもです、ね、よくあの聞かれる質問なのです
これについてちょっと教えてください。はい。はい。えっ、ー、と、おっしゃるようにですね、10年、15年ぐらい前までは、あのフランス料理店でフランスワインを飲むイタリア料理店でイタリアワインを飲むというのがあの比較的当たり前というか常識だったんですけれどもあのだんだんあのワインの、えー、と消費が、まあ、一般的になってきまして、うんでえーまあ、いろんな国のさまざまな国からワインが入ってきたっていうこともあるんですけれども。えーさまざまな飲食店で複数の国のワインをオンリストするという傾向がここ特に5年ぐらいで急速に広がっている印象です。でそれに伴ってあの家庭でもさまざまなジャンルの食事、まあ、和食、中華、イタリアン、フラン、フレンチ系ですね。いろんなあの食事と一緒にワインを楽しむようになってきてます。わかりました。いや、なんとなくあの自分の実体験からもまあそんな感じかなという気がいたしております。それでですね、あのまあこれはあのまあ、えー、まあ日本にも大都市それから中小都市たくさんありますけれども、何かそういうあのワインを飲む方にですね、あの。地域的によって、例えば東京の人はこれが好きだ、大阪の人はこれが好きだとか言った、そういったあの傾向というのは何かあるんでしょうか。地域的に差異ありますかね。えっ、ー、と、地域によるそのどのようなワインが好きか、この好みかというところまではちょっとわからないですけれども、ただあの東京を中心とした首都圏があの最もあのワインの消費量が。多いといとうのは事実ですねでやはりあの大都市の方がまあ人口が多いという単純な理由ですけれどもあの大阪、福岡というのもそれに続いて、えー、ワインの消費量は多いです。うん、ありがとうございます。えー、さて、これから先はですね、まあ、ちょっといろいろなあの、えー、特にあの南アフリカのワイン関係者、一番知りたがるあの質問かもしれませんけども、あのまずはですねあの、南アフリカワインがあの日本においてよく売れるために、最も重要なこと、これ、なんだと思われますか。はいえっと、これはあの、まあえっと、南アフリカだけに限らないと思うんですけれども、あのワインのストーリーリですねあのワインの背景、えー、ストーリー、歴史や文化、あるいは食文化、それからあのワイナリーさんそのものの、えー、創業者に、えー、や作りに関わる人々のそういった情報、えー、が非常に重要かと思います。ですからワイ,ワイナリーさんが、えー、とワインを通してどのようなメッセージを伝えるか。うんでそこに尽きるような気がしますありがとうございます。まあ、そういった意味でも、今日のプレゼンテーションはなかなか皆さん、その点も工夫を凝らしていたと、私はあの見受けました。次はですね、あの日本市場のまあ参入という観点でいくつかの質問をいただいているんですけれども、最初はですね、あのまあ、これはあの日本のインポーターさんがどんな方々なのかということに関するんですが、日本のインポーターの皆さんがですねあのビジネス相手として選ぶ、例えばあのワイン生産者に何かあの特徴とか特性とか、そういったものはあるのでしょうか、はい、あの大変あの難,し難しい質問で、<笑>まあのまあ、これ、一概には言えないんですけれども<笑>あの、やはり伝統的な生産者の方から、もう新進気鋭と呼ばれるようなあの生産者さんまでいらっしゃると思うんですよね。でただそのやっぱりあの先ほどの話にも通じるんですがあのいかに情熱を持ってワインを作っているかってでそれをそのやっぱり伝えていただくことそれからあの、まあ、日本の消臭感っていうのもありますのでまあ,あの本当基本的なことですけれどもあの日本人時間厳守するとかですねあの約束をあの守るとかあの期日についてで締め切りとかですねそういったことを割とあの気にするあの当たり前にあのそういう仕事をしてますのであのそういったことをもう理解し,たしていただいた上であで人間関係っていうのを大切にしていただければ
あの何かしらあのいい目が見えてくるんじゃないかと思います。ありがとうございます。まあ、その関連でですね、やっぱりこれもあの日本市場に参入する上でのまあ特徴になるのかもしれませんけど、何か重要なあの生産のプロセスにおけるあの慣習みたいなものがあるのかということと、それからまあもっとざくっとした質問になりますが、外国の,あのまあこういったあのワイナリーの皆さんにとっては、日本の市場っていうのは容易にあのアクセスできるものなのかどうかと、こういったこともよく聞かれます。これについては何かあのお答えいただけますでしょうか。はいえーとまあ、全て答えられるわけではないんですけれどもちょっと思ったことはですね日本は割合のパッケージとかラベルっていうことに結構敏感なんですね。であの例を挙げますとあの、まあ、例えばスーパーマーケットで売られてる野菜や果物を見ると最近では規格外のものっていうのもなちょっと専用のコーナーを作ってあの販売されるようになってはいるんですがあの今までというのは、えー、一般的にあの、えー、果物であっても野菜であっても一定の形状やサイズで統一されてるっていうのが一般的です。なので,なので今でもそれがやっぱり主流なんですよね。でなのであの、まあ、商品、えーというのはラベル汚れですとか破れがあるっていうようなことはあの基本的には許されなくて不良品あるいは割引価格でという対象になってしまいます。でそういったことですとかあるいはあの収納されている箱をですね箱が開けやすいかどうかとかあるいはそのその後にリサイクルがしやすいかとか。そういったこともあのバイヤーさん、販売の担当者の方っていうのは気にされるではないかと思います。でえっと、あと、ま、全くちょっと別のことですけれどもあの、最近ではやっぱり有機栽培であるとか、あの低農薬、あるいはサステイナブルの認証が、えー、あるかどうかっていうこともやっぱりあの、えー、手に取る、あるいは販売する、えー、一つのポイント。ではないいかと思いますし特に若い世代の方が、えー、エシカル消費ということに敏感だという報告も出ていますので、えー、そういった点も参考になるかもしれません。そして、えーまあえー、海外の事業者さんからの,あのアクセスというのはこれ、まあ、本当に出会いどういう輸入元さんの方とのあるいは、えー、そうですねあの、本当にタイミングであったり、あの人間関係、えー、に、えー、尽きるんだと思います。頑張ってください。ありがとうございます。いや、なかなかあの、えあのまあ、これもあの、眼畜に飛んだあの答えいただきまして、ありがとうございます。あのまあ、これもあのなかなか、ね、一概には言えない話かもしれませんけども、ね、あの日本人に対してワインを売る際にですね、まあ、何かあのこうしたアプローチは好まれるとか、何かそういったものってありますかね。うんこれもまたあの一言では言,言えない<笑>すいません質問で、ね<笑>、大変あの難しい質問なんですけれども、うんあの、やはりワイナリーさんの規模いやその個性とあの、日本、あのもちろんそのワイナリーさんの数も多いですし日本の輸入元さんの数も多いので、えー、それぞれの規模や個性、えー、どういったワインをど,どういうあのところに販売されたいかっていうところが合致しなければいいあのマッチングにならないと思うんですよねそこが本当に大変なことだと思いますが。あのちょっと一括りにはできないのでぜひトライしてみて実感していただければと思います。全くあのおっしゃる通りだと思います。あのそこでですね例えばあの、まあ、どういうところをターゲットにするかということに、まあ、なってくるわけなんですけれどもあの、まあ、ワインが成功する場合には、まあ、いわゆるそのレストラン等での提供を考える。まあ、オントレードなのか、それとも小売店等でですね、あのまあ、あの販売するという、まあ、いわゆるオフトレードなのか、南アフリカのワインが成功しているのは、このオントレード、オフトレードのどちらなんでしょうかね。はい
、えー、と今のところなんですけれどもあのどこの科学体においても南アフリカのワインは圧倒的にオフトレートの方が、えー、今のところは強いです。でえー、と割合で言いますと、オン対オフで3対7ぐらいの割合です。分かりました。そういうことは、これからますますちょっとオントレードの方にも少しあの力を入れてやっていくのが市場の開拓になるかと思うんですけども、まあ、その関連で、あの一つご質問なんですけれども、日本っていうのは非常にあの美味しいレストランの多いところで有名で、ミシュランの星付きレストランは、まあ、最も多く存在する国の一つだというふうに思いますけれども。このレストランにはですね、どのようなところがワインを提供しているんでしょうかね。はいえー、と日本では一般的にあの業務店ですね、えー、と飲食店には、えー、飲食店専,専門の、えー、主販店さんが、えー、ワ,インワインも含めた種類を販売していらっしゃいます。うんなので、えっと、輸入元さんがまあ直接ということもあるんですけれども、大体いい輸入元さんから主販店、それからレストランという仕組みになっていますので、うん、あの輸入元の方々というのは、あの飲食店さんに営業をするとともに、その、えー、ターゲットとする、えーまあ、業務専門の主販店さんにも両方営業して、うん、で初めて、えー、購入されるというケースが非常に多いと思います。で、あのまあ、ミシュランの星付きレストランも確かに多いんですけれども、あのそういった、えー、とレストランさんに強い業務用の主販店さんっていうのも、えー、いくつか存在しますので、あのそういったところに、えー、アプローチされたいということでしたら、まあ、まず輸入元さんが決まってでその輸入元さんと、えー、こういうレストランに、えー、売りたいんだって置いてほしいんだっていうことを、あのーまあ、よくよく伝えられてですねあの一緒に、えー、ターゲットを決めて一緒に営業されるっていうのが、あのー、一番いい方法ではないかと思います、まあ、あの星付きレストランの話になったところで今度はプレミアムワインの話にちょっと持っていきたいんですけれども。あのたくさんの,にはあのプレミアムワインがありますで日本においてこのプレミアムな南アフリカのワインの、まあ、ターゲットとなるのは、まあ、どのような市場だと思いますか、はいえー、と価格帯が高いほどあのワ,インワインの専門ショップですとかあるいは中高級クラスの飲食店、えー、そういったところにはあのワインの知識が豊富なあのスタッフの方、まあ、もちろんソムリエさんも含めて、えー、なぜこのワインは、えーまあ、プレミアムなのかということをきちんと説明できる、えー、方たちがスタッフが常駐するお店がオーターゲットさとされるといいと思います、えー、っと次の質問はですねこれもあの南アフリカに結構あの特徴的なことかと思うんですけれども、一つのワイナリーさんがものすごいレンジのワインをたくさん作ってらっしゃるんですね。まあ、そうした場合、あの日本の市場に参入する際は、その全種類のワインを持って参入するの方がいいのか、それともあの、まあまあ、選び抜いた少数の、まあ、ワイン、品種に、まあ、集中して参入した方が良いのか、その辺については何かアドバイスとございますか。はい、これもあの難しい質問ですけれども、いあのいいあの輸入元さんによってその、えーと、強いマーケット、流通網というのがあのそれぞれ異なりますので、えー、やっぱりその輸入元さんと、本当にあの、えー、そのワイナリーさんの本社の,そのワインをです、ね、一通りじっくり試飲してもらって、一緒に試飲をして、えー、話し合ってで、どういうターゲットがいいんだろうかということをあの本当にあの決めて、えー、行かれるっていうのが、やっぱり一番いいと思います。はい、ありがとうございます。あの今日も、まあ、いく出ていただいたところのいくつかも、まあ、かなり小規模で、まあ、言ってみればほとんどまあ手売りみたいな感じのワイナリーが。なんですけれどももういらっしゃるんですけれどももちろん大規模なところにいらっしゃいましたけれどもそういったあの小売りかつ手売りというようなワイナリーはですねどうやって日本の市場にあの参入を目指せばよいと思われますか
これもあの一概には言えないんですけれどもあの本当に小さな規模でやってらっしゃるんでしたらばもしかするとその小規模な輸入元さんとコンタクトされる方がいいのかもしれませんあのやっぱりあの大きな輸入元さんもちっちゃな輸入元さんもありますけれどもちっちゃくても非常にあの熱心になさっているところもありますのではい。えっと、次の質問はですね、あのまあ、日本にはですねあの、南アフリカのワインにあの関心ある人っていうのはたくさんまあいらっしゃると思うんですけれども、そこからあの日本市場での,あの南アフリカ産ワインの成長、ただ関心から成長ということなんですに、つながる可能性というのは、これはあるんでしょうか。はいあのーこれは、えー、と印,象的印象としてですねあの、南アフリカワインの絶大なファン、あのまあ、南アフリカワインにはまっちゃう人ですね、があの非常に増えてきているなというふうに感じているんですよね。で,ですのであの、もう本当にあの発信、いろんな情報をですね、発信されて南アフリカワインの情報があの増えれば増えるほどその関心がですね増していくんじゃないかというふうに思っています。であ,のあとやはり南アフリカならではというか南アフリカだからこういうワインがこういうスタイルのワインが生まれるんだ。というふうにあの南アフリカでしか作れないワインのスタイル、えー、ですとかあるいはまあブドウ品種も含めてですねあの他の国にない、えー、特徴というのをどんどん発信していかれて、えー、そうし,しましたらあの非常にあの確かな市場を獲得されるんではないかと思いますありがとうございます。ちょっとあの経路の変わった質問をさせていただいてよろしいでしょうか。まだまだあのコロナ禍がまあ続いているのですけれども、まあ、日本の場合、ようやくあの最近は状況が良くなってきたというふうに理解してますけれども、日本の,あの高級レストランはですね、まあ、特にあのこういうワインをですねあのたくさんあの仕入れている高級レストラン、このコロナの影響っていうのはどうだったんでしょうかね。はいえーとまあ、高級であろうとなかろうと非常にあの飲食店さん大きな打撃を受けられたんですよね。で本当にあのやっとやっと今あのようやく普通にワインが販売できる状態になって皆さん喜ばれています。でただですねあの実際に聞いてみますと意外とあの高級レストランの方がその打撃は少なかったみたいなんですよね。うんでその理由はあの、まあ、もともとその高級店の方がスペースに余裕があってつまりあのフィジカルディスタンシングが取りやすい環境にあってあの、まあ、ですので価格帯が安いほど、まあ、やっぱギュッとしたあのスペースで大人数ということになりますので、えー、とそういったあの感染対策が取りやすい環境がもともとあったということとあとあのまあえーまあ、オーナーというか、まあ、バックがあって、金銭的な余裕もあって、えー、新たな感染対策のも取りやすいということもあったようです。で、それから、うんあのまあ、お客様はですね、あのまあ、本当にあのコアなあの乗客の方たちっていうのを掴んでいらっしゃって、ですので、あのむしろその予約が取れなかったレストランが、あの予約を取りやすくなったっていう声も聞こえてきたです、ねうんね、あの意外とその高級店さんの方があの苦労は少なかったように聞いています。であのそういったレストランであのワインが売れない期間もあの種類販売が禁止されていたあの期間もありますけれどもそういったあの期間でもノンアルコールですとかお茶を出すというような、うんあの工夫をされて、えーまあ、ワイン飲めないの残念だけれども、食事だけでもというお客様は結構いらっしゃったです、うん、確
確かに、ね、最近はあのこちらでもあのノンアルコールのペアリングというのは結構あのいろんなところで見かけるようになってまして、まあ、そういったこともいろいろとそういったレストランが、まあ、あのやっていく上には重要なことなのかなというのは実感しております。ありがとうございます。え最後の質問に<笑>移らせていただきます。あのこれはですねあの、まあ、あの今のコロナの話もまあそうなんですけども、まあ、これからの話なんですよね。あの今後数年におけるあの日本での,あのワイン消費の動向、これをどのように予測されますか、なかなか予測っていうのは難しいっていうこと、よく分かっていながら、あえて質問させていただけるんですけれども、どんなふうな見通しですかね。<笑>はいえっと、まずはその、まずは、えっと、コロナ前ですね、コロナ前の2019年にいつ頃戻るのかということですけれども、あの1年。で戻ってほしいと思いつつでも2年ぐらいかかるんじゃないかなというふうにも見ています。うん、でその後、まあどのぐらい伸びるのかしばらくちょっとあの停滞というかあのそれほど伸びがあの伸びていかない、えー、時代が続いていますのでその後何とかして、えー、伸ばしていきたい。まあ、期待値ですけれども少しずつ伸び,伸びてほしいと思っていますあの。スパークリングの方がもしかすると早く戻ってくるかもしれないですね。うん、なるほどありがとうございます。あの大変あのこれはまだ展望としてはですねあの南アフリカのワインを売っていくのに大変良い展望ではないかなという感じもいたしますし、まあ、その増えてるワインの多くがですね、まあ、南アフリカ産であることを私も強く強くあの期待しております。あの名越さん、本当に今日はあのお忙しくありがとうございました。大変あの貴重なえあのアドバイスをいただきまして、これはあのこれから日本の市場に行きたいという方々、今、日本の市場にいるけど、もっといろいろとあの、えー、展開していきたいという方々にとって、非常に貴重になる、参考になるお話だったと思っております。改めてあの共催者の一人としてあのお礼申し上げます。ありがとうございました。ありがとうございます。こちらこそ、拙い説明で失礼いたしました。ではこれであのまたあの、えー、コーネルセン教授の方にマイクを戻したいと思います。Thank you very much, Ambassador Mariama and、uh, Ms. Nagoshi. This was a, a, a most useful、um, session, and、um, all of the participants learned a great deal from your,、um, your insight and your expertise about the, the Japanese wine market. So, thank you very much, Ms. Nagoshi, for your contribution. Uh, we are over time,、um, so I will be very brief now. And、uh, I would just like to、um, thank all of the presenters today for,、um, for all of the、uh, highly informative, very detailed, and, and very rich presentations. We learned a lot、um, from all of the、uh, presenters.、Um, I think that there would be a, a big interest,、uh, in, especially in the, the last session with、uh, Ms. Nagoshi. That's why I want to.、Um, Uh, draw your attention once again to the video of、uh, or the recording of、um, today's webinar, which we are going to、uh, make available. You can access the recording of today's webinar on Stellenbosch University、um, International's webpage. We've、uh, de developed a、uh, webpage、um, spe specifically for the、um, co hosted webinars. Um, with Stellenbosch and with the Embassy of Japan. So、um, we will、uh, post the recording of today's、um, webinar on、um, that dedicated、uh, webpage. And、uh, I see Lydia has, has just、um, posted the, the link、um, uh, of the, of the webpage. And then just finally to ask that you、uh, do remember to、um, send any questions that. Uh, you want to, to ask to any, any of the presenters,、um, any of the follow up questions that, that you would like to, to discuss. And if you want to、um, uh, have access to the um, information, um, contact details,、uh, and so forth of、um, any of the speakers、uh, today, I'm sure that we can also、um, arrange something for you. So、um, please. Contact us via the webpage、um, that Lydia has posted in the, the chat、um, function. And then finally, please remember Lydia will、uh, send to all participants a feedback form. We would like to hear your feedback about、um, today's webinar 
as well as yesterday's webinar for those who were in attendance. So please do um, complete that feedback form. And um, now it remains to me just to once again, thank um, everybody uh, for the attendance, for their time, for the lively participation, um, for um, the um, uh, rich um, and amazing um, uh, information that, that we were given during um, this webinar. And uh, for me to thank also our, um, our partners, um, One's Magazine, Warza Japan, and um, the University of Yamanashi in Japan. And um, of course, um, the Embassy of Japan uh, with um, whom we've been having a, a successful uh, working relationship um, with these webinars. And I would like to, um, the last word is to thank Ms. Miko Yoshimura, uh, who is our interpreter, served as our interpreter and who has done an excellent job um, uh, throughout. So thank you very much, uh, Ms. Yoshimura, for, for your professionalism and for your excellent, um, your excellent work. Thank you. So until next time. <laughs>